Four, three, two, one. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. okay. Welcome everyone. Welcome aboard to our Inosai you know, Marine School Youth Webinar. So basically, it's conjunctions with World Ocean Day 2022, World Ocean uh, on 8th June. But we from the you know same IUM, we uh, we apply, we invite for you for our World Ocean Month program for this June. And this youth webinar is actually one of the programs that is embedded in our World Ocean Month 2022. Welcome aboard and good morning everyone. Assalamualaikum again. Okay, we are going to start our session with Mukitab Al-Fatihah. That was my shot. Okay, so for today, 13 June, uh, we started a bit uh, right now is 10, 9 a.m. So it's 9 beyond the 10 a.m. from the schedule one. And our topic today is actually on marine pollution, what it is. So this is a, a presentation. It's a presentation, it's a group presentation from student of Bachelor of Honours Marine Science and Technology, Bachelor of Science, Marine Science and Technology Honours, I'm sorry, uh, for the batch 211. And then the subject of SMT 1223 Chemical Oceanography. So this is part of a uh, presentation assignment. So where, where all the students will share, will share some information about the topic that I have been circulated in the poster before. And for the presentation for today, it will on 15 minutes presentations and followed by Q&A sessions. I put it as a five minutes and then I will be the timekeeper for that. And the Q&A sessions for those that you wanted to ask, you can just directly ask. You can open the mic and ask for the questions. And if you are feel not so uh, feel so nervous in asking questions, then you can just put in the chat box, okay? And then I will I will throw that to the speaker for the time, okay? <laughs> so we're going to start that uh, our sessions. So basically, I will I will intro some about our our topic today. So this is the Earth, the Earth that we are living right now. As you can see that our planet Earth, our blue planet, is consists of more than 70% of ocean water, that blue color there. So even though Earth or the land that we are, we are stepping right now is only around 35 to 30%, but the Earth is still, this planet is still called the Earth, not the oceans. So I put that to your imaginations, why is that? Why is we are not naming our planet as ocean, but we put it as Earth instead? Okay, I put it in your let let your imaginations go on that matter. So ocean is very vast, and it actually actually give us about the oxygen more than half fifty percent of our oxygen that we are daily consume due to the phytoplanktons and a lot of process that happens inside the oceans. Okay, and then this is some of the view inside our oceans. It's a very beautiful, it have lots of fishes, have lots of organisms, it have lots of uh, coral reef, we have a lot of seagrass, seaweed, and lots of kelp. And I, I cannot name it because it's too vast. As you can see that ocean is more than 70% of our Earth, right? Our planet Earth. So you will name that we have so much organisms that can be embedded there. Okay. This is a picture. I'm telling you a story that this is a picture that viral before from a National Geographic is took by Justin Hoffman in Indonesia. So they, it, he took a picture of seahorse. Well, start with it's, well, it's very cute. And so, sudden that seahorse actually 
carry along something that should not be exist in the oceans. So that it is that then this photo has become viral. Then everyone's like, ah, oh, what happened to our ocean? What, what have we done there? So sudden. And then during that time, most of people know that, oh, we must do something about the ocean. But if, if, if I would, frankly speaking, that the, the move to protect our ocean is actually it's from, uh, it's from long, long time ago. But it's just that we have realized right now that the move is not so impacted. And then we are getting for a new strategy for that. And then this is it. Okay, the impact that we have been uh, doing so far for the old, old ocean. And we can't see it because some of us are just live on earth and do not see ocean at all. But globally, I think globally, internet and uh, lots of uh, social media, we can do much on this matter. So the fishes that I just show you right now, the very beautiful ocean, the blue ocean just now, it consists all of this because it's very vast. Some of the location is impacted by this and some are not. But generally, generally, this is, this is it. And these six features that we are going to share the information to all of you here by the students of the SMT uh, 1223. So basically they will all share some information about this picture to us. And I would say that I hope that the information will give you, will give you a, an idea for a move or kick something in our brain that we should and we hope that we can save our ocean. Okay, so maybe, and oh yes, I would like to share to you that uh, in terms of global global movement, uh, wait, uh, yes, in terms of global movement, that the United Nations has started an ocean decade, started from 2021-2030. So within these 10 years, the United Nations has uh, urged for all the nations to, to focus to repair our oceans within these 10 years. So hopefully we can we can go into that objective as fast as we can within these 10 years. And so you can go to their website and you can try to navigate and view lots of things that has embedded inside. Okay, lots of activities, lots of news, lots of global coordination that has been shared here. Okay, and for today also, I would like this is some part of you for you to, to, to view of our institute website. You can just Google, you know, some IUM and you can view and what is what what we have done as part of our contributions to that. And also you can view about uh, the Department of Marine Science, about our program. So you can just Google Department of Marine Science of IUM. Okay. And later, all of these sessions will be saved here inside our YouTube channel. Okay. Before this, we also have uh, several, uh, several projects and several talks or several sessions that we have been shared here for you too, to gain some information. Okay. So, sorry. Okay, without further ado, I think we can start our, our sessions with the first group. I think the first group will be from uh, Ocean as Education, if I'm second. Uh, you are ready? So I think I give the floor to you. You can share your screen right now and start. If there is any hiccup, you can just tell me here. Yeah. 
Can you see the screen? Can you see? Dr. Kenneth Park? No. Uh, wait. Usually, no need to stop one. Okay. All right. So, assalamualaikum um, and a very good morning, everyone. So, first of all, greetings to distinguished professors, um, students, and also the members of the floor. So, inshallah, um, today we will begin our presentation, Ocean Acidification. And in case throughout our presentation, there is some um, palatal or uh, areas in our facts or somehow, I hope that everyone here could interrupt and correct us. Freely. All right, so moving on to ocean acidification, um, me and my teammates, uh, Anis, will present on the background history and the chemistry part of ocean acidification and also the real impact. Um, we will go through some of the impacts of ocean acidification on the marine ecosystem and also as human being as a whole. All right, next slide. So first of all, we will go through on the background and history of ocean acidification. So, sorry, is that moving? No. Very good. Maybe try this. Um, pergi belakang nanti. Try pergi belakang nanti. Paling kanan. They usually they will go. All right, cool. Okay. Oops. All right. So first of all, what is ocean acidification? Generally, ocean acidification is a reduction in the pH of the ocean over an extended period of time caused primarily by uptake of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So what caused it to, ha uh, to happen? So we need to understand first, like uh, how the ocean works in terms of the carbon intake. So the ocean absorbs approximately or statistically said by scientists uh, research is 30% of the carbon dioxide that is released in the atmosphere. But this number, it increased by the levels of, um, as the levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide increase from the human activities. And human activities comes in the ranges of um, activities, the anthropogenic activities. The amount of carbon dioxide absorbed by the ocean also increases. So it can be said that maybe today it is already exceeded more than 30%. So when carbon dioxide is absorbed by seawater, what can happen is basically a series of chemical reactions will be disturbed. Mean, meaning that, I'm um, sorry, when the carbon dioxide um, absorbed by seawater, the chemical processes will happen. But in terms of excess carbon dioxide intake into the seawater, it also will interrupt the chemical reactions. So the chemical reactions occur resulting in the increased concentration of hydrogen ions. So this process has far reaching implications for the ocean and the creatures that live there. We need to say that this really give a very, um, it impact the marine ecosystem um, in the ocean itself. So next slide. So what factors contributes to ocean acidification? As you see here that we put the industrial revolution, but this is not the only factors that actually contributing to ocean acidification, but we will say that this is the beginning of everything. So we see that industrial revolution began um, back in 200 plus minus years ago. So we see that starting from the industrial revolution, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has increased due to our, acti uh, due to our activities and actions. And this is, only the beginning. We see that today, up until today, the fossil burning and also the deforestation or any kind of changing in lands, urbanization and so forth is actually affecting in the more increased level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And um, by, by it takes, it will actually resulting to this ocean acidification and also other climate change. All right, next slide. So this is what we can see. Um, first of all, we'll go on the pictures below. So we see here is the sea, uh, the surface ocean pH. There is a variation in that. We see that it is have a regional difference. Um, we see that the orange part is the concentrated part. And this is taken, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, by like five years back. And we see in 1751, the pH of surface ocean is 8.25. And by 1996, or in, uh, where we say that this period is around the Industrial Revolution, it goes um, down to 8.14. So the pH surface ocean waters has fallen by 0 0.1 pH. So this might not sound kind of like a big difference, a huge difference, right? But we have to remember 
that the definition of pH is in the terms of logarithmic. So this change that represented by 0 0.1 pH actually approximately represent a 30% increase in the acidity of the overall of our surface ocean. So we can understand um, by at, at, at the very above, the pH scale is an inverse of hydrogen ion concentrations. So when there is more hydrogen ions, translate to high acidity and a lower pH of it. All right, next slide. So this is basically the summarized um, presented by National Oceanic Administration, sorry, Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, US Department, um, the summary of how acidic ocean acidifications occur. So we see that carbon dioxide absorbed by the atmosphere. And as we learned in the previous um, previous lectures by Dr. Fuad, there is a lot of sources of carbon dioxide being absorbed, um, being absorbed to, to the oceans. And we also have other sources like the byproduct of marine organism. So we see that when the carbon dioxide mixed with water, it will produce carbonate ion or also the carbonate acid, and it will actually, it can be deassociated de into bicarbonate ions. So um, to understand this better, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, all right, so we see that this is kind of like the, this, um, the, the, the inversion or the reversible process that can happen. So the, um, the carbonate acid can go, sorry, the, yeah, the carbonate acid, yeah, the, the carbonate acids can go into bicarbonate and then can actually transform into carbonate ions. So usually in a, what we see in, in, in a normal um, state of um, base or, or the, when the ocean is basic, we see that the carbonate ions will um, combine with calcium and produce calcium carbonate. That is actually the main source of all shells um, that have, we have in the ocean. Uh, so this kind of like process is very much affected by temperature and alkalinity. That's why we see that ocean acidification plus with uh, plus with uh, global warming will be will bring a total catastrophe to the uh, to the to our ocean. So on the right side, we see the gyrium plot. I, I, I suggest that is how we pronounce it. So we see in this plot in this graph basically explain um, with the different pH starting from the acidity from the left to the to the neutral and to the base what is the dominant state of um, our carbon in the ocean? So we see that in acidic, the most dominated is carbon carbon dioxide. And when um, the pH is basic, uh, the, the most dominated is the carbonic, uh, yeah, carbonic ions. And in the basic is the carbonate ions. So HCO3 is, is it, sorry, HCO3, is bicarbonate. Okay, so it was predicted that by 2100, the ocean surface pH will be 7.8, which is around the neutral. So we will see later that actually um, the bicarbonate ions will dominate it. And we see that the blue lines in this plot consider that when the pH is becoming more acidic, the carbonate ions will decrease and more bicarbonate ion will form. And we see here that the amount of calcium carbonate that can be produced will be lesser because calcium have to compete with hydrogen ions, which will, of course, will go to hydrogen because hydrogen is more, uh, yeah, in the, in the level of um, chemical, chemical compound, it will move more kind of like form into bicarbonate instead of calcium. So it will means that more shells struggle to be formed at the end of the day. All right, so I think that's all in terms of the chemistry part. We will go to the impact part. I pass to Ali. Thank you, everyone. Uh, now I will continue on how ocean acidification can give a huge impact uh, from the marine organism. And this impact will continuously uh, affect to human itself. Okay. Firstly, um, ocean acidification uh, can give impact on shell builders. Okay, uh, since uh, Sister Aruni, Aruni already explained to us on how uh, carbonate ions um, important uh, play important role for the shell, uh, since the, the carbonate ion um, is, uh, dissolves into uh, can form hydrogen ion, which is lead to increasing pH. This hydrogen ion uh, will subsequently can uh, prevent the carbonate ion 
that is essential for the shell for the for to build and maintain the shells, skeletons, and other calcium carbonate structures. Then you can see that these uh, hydrogen ions uh, will avoid the carbonate ion to uh, fuse with the shells uh, of the marine organism. And uh, a study, a ANOAA funded study, has documented that ocean acidification along the U.S. Pacific Northwest course is impacting the shells and sensory organs of some young Dungeness crab, a prize crustacean that support the most valuable fishery on the West Coast. Um, as the ocean acidification increase, available carbonate ion bond with excess hydrogen result in a few carbonate ion available for calcifying organisms to build and maintain their shells. So, uh, I want to show uh, on next, I want to show on how this ocean acidification can, um, can give uh, impact to the marine organism. One of them is pterophoid. Uh, from this video, uh, there's a difference uh, when one of marine organisms live in two different water conditions. On the left side, we can see that the pteropod is uh, actively swimming and its uh, its shell is uh, its shell is uh, quite uh, we can see it has a strong structure of shell. While on the right side, on the other hand, the skeleton of the report, this one, it starts to dissolve because of the acidity in the water. Okay, next, ocean acidification impact on fish and seaweeds still in the marine organism. The ability of some fish, like clownfish, uh, since the pH in the water can affect, uh, detect the predators, uh, can um, detect the predators is decreased in more acidic water. Studies shown that um, low pH level in water can affect the ability, the side view of the clownfish to catch, uh, to get more, to catch or to see more plankton in the, in the coral reef. So, uh, they will be more difficult to locate uh, habitat and to get more uh, their food source. When these organisms are at risk, the entire food web also will be at risk. Okay, next, sorry. Ocean acidification also can affect uh, the seaweeds. Um, while some species will be harmed by ocean acidification, algae and sea grasses may benefit from higher carbon dioxide conditions in the ocean as they require carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, just like plants on land. So there are some ongoing studies uh, that still examine if growing seaweed can um, help slow ocean acidification. And lastly, um, actually after all the marine organisms affected, uh, it will subsequently affect to human itself, okay. Um, Estimates of future carbon dioxide level based on business as usual emission scenarios indicate that by the end of this century, the surface waters of the ocean could have pH around 7.8. As uh, since Tony told before, in 1997, still 8.1. Now it decreased to 7.8. That can give a uh, more higher um, acidity in water. The last time the ocean pH was this low was during the Middle East Ocean, 40 to 70 million years ago. The Earth was several degrees warmer and a major extinction event was occurring. Okay. Actually, uh, I can conclude that uh, from general view, ocean acidification that rooted from human activities can affect can affect the marine organisms at first and then include uh, reef, fish, and seaweeds. And then this ocean acidification will subsequently disrupt the food chain. Um, as the end, human being, our, we, ourselves, will also get affected back as we are the consumers of this marine organism. So what you give, you get back. Uh, that's all from us. Um, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Sister Anis and also Sister Auni, I would like to open the floor if you have something to ask 
about the social certifications, if anything, or any comment or any just just a thought or anything, no problem at all. You can ask directly or you can give me inside the chat box, okay? And maybe on my, my side also, I, I have something to wonder about uh, Sister Aoni and Sister Anis. How about how about the ocean distribution in our our region, eh? uh, in our Malaysian waters? What what is the what is the latest or latest trend on this latest news on about this on our side? Do you know something about this? Um, unfortunately, I didn't do any kind of the readings that the our, I mean, national level, Malaysia specifically. But um, Sister Anis, do you have anything? Um, since uh, for the past two years, uh, we are currently in COVID, uh, COVID pandemic. So the economy in Malaysia are quite uh, decreasing. So um for now the economy started again so we can see that um uh, uh the 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 quality water in um in malaysia uh is not uh, too bad compared to others country which has more more worst uh condition of um facility of water because uh we are not so uh we are not so we are still in we are the developing country, but compared to other country, we are still in the moderate um, level. You, you, do you do you say that COVID nineteen is good for environment? Uh, for me, for me, uh, I but think, not good for us. Uh, good for the environment, but not good for us because yeah, we can save a little bit, little bit the water, uh, the ocean. <laughs> I see, I see. Okay. Okay, then thank you so much for this group, Sister Aoni and Sister Anis, uh, for a very good presentation. So, we're going to the next presenter, which is a topic of plastic debris. Okay, so the presenter will be uh, Brother Lukmani and Brother Nasan. Right. You can share your slide the floor is yours Please unmute first. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear a thing. Look, man. Oh, anyone else okay with the sound? I didn't hear a thing. Ah, okay, then then not me lah. Try to check on your microphone. It's okay, I give you time. Ah, I, I hear a bit of sound microphone. Hello, hello, assalamualaikum. Ah, no, it's okay. Okay. Please. Right now, we from group two will present about marine pollution uh, regarding plastic debris. Oh. Okay. 
what is uh, plastic debris. Plastic pollution has become a global environmental problem affecting affecting all parts of ocean worldwide, including the most remote, such as deep sea floor or polar regions. Plastic that acts as pollutants are categorized by size into micro, meso, or macro debris. Plastic are inexpensive and durable, making them very adaptable for different uses. As a result, manufacturers choose to use plastic over other materials. Larger plastics are categorized into meso debris, which is between 5 mm to 2 cm, while macro debris is plastic that is larger than 2 cm. Uh, talking about the source, the source of plastic debris, most marine debris, which is 80% of them, comes from trash and debris in urban runoff or known as land based sources. Actually, there is two types of debris sources, which is land-based and ocean-based sources. Key components of land-based sources include litter, trash, and debris from construction, ports, and marinas, commercial and industrial facilities. Another types of plastic sources is ocean-based that includes overboard discharge from ships and discard fishing gear that account for that the other 20 percent okay. we will continue with the issue raises from plastic debris pollution and before that we need to know that plastic is a synthetic organic polymer made from petroleum with properties ideally suited for a wide variety of application there is over 300 million tons of plastic are produced every year, half of which is used to create single-use items such as our daily shopping bags, cups, and straws. Uh, there's at least 14 million tons of plastic end up in the ocean every year. Plastic debris is currently the most abundant type of litter in the ocean, making up to 18% 80% of all marine debris found from surface water to deep sea sediments. Plastic is found on the shorelines of every continent with more plastic waste found near popular tourist destination and densely populated areas. Under the influence of solar UV radiation, wind, currents and other natural factors, plastic breaks down into smaller particles that we give it another name, which is microplastic and that will be later explained by other group. Many countries lack the infrastructure to prevent plastic pollution, such as uh, sanitary landfills and incineration facilities. This leads to plastic leakage into rivers and the ocean. The legal and illegal global trade of plastic waste may also damage ecosystem, where waste management systems are not sufficient to contain plastic waste. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, next, moving on to the impacts of the plastic debris. But before that, uh, did you guys know in 2016, uh, there's a study uh, revealed that uh, plastic uh, were found in the deepest trench, uh, which is Mariana Trench. Uh, so scientists found it by looking through the deep sea debris database, uh, a collection of photos and videos taken from 5,010 different dive, divers uh, over the past 30 years uh, that was uh, recently made public. So this information showing that how the plastic debris issue has very it worsened the uh, scenario of our world. Uh, with that, the impacts uh, can be separated into a few types, which is um, impacts on marine ecosystem, impacts on food and human health, and last one, impacts on tourism. So the first one, impacts on the marine <coughs> system. Uh, 
this can uh, easily explain by the uh, habitat and the marine organism itself. So the most uh, visible impacts on plastic debris are ingestion, suffocation, entanglement uh, of hundreds of marine species, uh, which can be seen in the slide. Uh, you see the, the, the turtle is suffocated because there is a plastic uh, over its head. Uh, so uh, it will suffocate the turtle and later die. Uh, marine wildlife such as seabirds, whales, fish and turtle mistake plastic waste for prey. Uh, so this uh, can be uh, explained by when they thought it was food or it was a jellyfish. So they eat the plastic and then die uh, because uh, yeah, you, you eat plastic, then you die. Uh, as the starv uh, most of them then die of starvation as their stomach become filled with plastic. Uh, they also suffer from lacration, infection, reduced ability to swim. Uh, such as a seal who, who is uh, stuck into the plastic that stuck to the coral reef, uh, if you can imagine. So they can, uh, the, the seal cannot swim. Uh, so when they cannot swim, they will die of suffocation. Uh, and last one, floating plastic also help transport invasive marine species, thereby threatening marine biodiversity and the food web. Uh, next. Uh, how can this plastic debris issue impacts on food or, and human health? So microplastic uh, microplastic have been found in tap water uh, in uh, uh, studies uh, collected in the world ocean, including the Arctic. So uh, this microplastic issue is very uh, wide and very um, common nowadays to, to found the microplastic. So several chemical used in the production of plastic material are known to be carcinogenic and it will interfere with the body's endocrine system. So uh, the effect of microplastic is very, very vital to human uh, endocrine system, causing developmental uh, uh, reproductive neurological and immune disorder in both human and wildlife. So with much of microplastic in our body, it will uh, uh, disturb our body system and suddenly die. Uh, recently, microplastic were found in human placenta. But more research is needed to determine if this uh, is widespread problem. Toxic contaminant, uh, contaminant contaminants uh, also accumulate on the surface of plastic as a result prolonged exposure to seawater. Uh, when marine organisms ingest plastic debris, this contaminant will contain contaminant enter the digestive system. Uh, then over the time it will accumulate in the food web. Uh, so uh, maybe you guys ask how can the plastic can be enter our body. Uh. So it enter the, the fish body first, into the uh, body system first, and then we eat the fish, then we get the microplastic. Uh. The transfer of contaminants between marine species and human through consumption of seafood, consumption of seafood has been identified as health hazard and research is ongoing. And the last one, uh, impacts on tourism. How can the plastic debris impacts on tourism? Uh, for example, if you go to the uh, Sabah, uh, Sabahan, uh, beach and uh, you would see uh, in the recent years there's a lot of uh, dirty beach uh, that uh, uh, what spread with a lot of waste and plastic water bottle uh. so you as a tourist you pay so much money and then you 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 go to somewhere like that you will be like oh no I, I will not repeat to this place uh, so this plastic we uh, this plastic uh, waste or plastic issue will um, what we call that damage the aesthetic value of tourist destination, leading to decreased income from tourism. Uh, it also generates major economic costs related to the cleaning and maintenance of the sites. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, first we lose the money from tourism, then we have to spend more money to clean the uh, to clean the place. Uh. The build out of the plastic litter on the beaches can have negative impact on the country's economy, wildlife, and physical physiology, well-being of people. So when no longer people go to that place, that place uh, is become less popular and suddenly close. Uh, so it's very, very uh, uh, waste, uh, waste. Uh, and last one, uh, what can we do? Uh, what can the, 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 the method that we can overcome this problem? So the first one, of course, we can enforce the law for individuals or company who throw rubbish and waste in the ocean. So enforce the law here, we can uh, uh, sue them or uh, make uh, make them uh, uh, take, uh, what, 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 what you call that? Pick, pick, uh, pick, pick, pick up the, the, the trash that they throw uh, like that. Uh, so it's uh, it's uh, everybody's job. Uh, if you see at, uh, for example, at Pantai Teluk Cepedak, right? Someone throw rubbish and you scold them. Uh, you say, take back the rubbish. Uh, you rubbish, uh, like that. And second, uh, what we can do, consumer and society must shift to more sustainable consumption pattern. For example, use less plastic. Obviously, use less plastic. Or use the more biodegradable plastic. Uh, as we all know, technology nowadays is very advanced. So we can, it's our choice to use the more biodegradable plastic. Uh, and third one, redesign the product and rethink their use of disposal to reduce microplastic waste from pellets, synthetic textile, or tires. Uh, so this is uh, more like to the to the company of uh, making the tires and whatsoever lah. So they have to rethink their product. Uh, on how to make the plastic is more uh, reduced uh, or more to dispose uh, like that. And last one, more funding to for the innovation. Of course, uh, when you want uh, them, when you uh, what require them to innovate something, you must give them money, yeah, money, yeah, money. So, so the the what the government the, the government have to fund more money uh, to this company so that they can implement the technology behavior and policy solution to address marine plastic pollution. Uh, I guess uh, that's all from our group. Uh, if there are any question. Alhamdulillah, thank you so much, Brother Nazhan, Brother oh, and sorry, Brother Manuel. Yeah? No, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh -huh. for the presentations. If there is anyone who wants to ask question, even from your class also, you can ask questions to this group. Eh? On my side, actually, I, well, I, I just ah, hear yes, money, I money, money. Anis okay, Anis? Oh. Okay. Anis? Eh? Oh, yeah, biodegradable plastic too also can uh, affect them too. Oh, actually, um, Biodegradable is not solving the problem uh, in a fuller. It's just uh, uh, one step closer. Uh, one step closer for us to innovate a, a better uh, future. Uh, yes, a better future. So biodegradable is, uh, means that it, it, it's the plastic that uh, has lesser time time of period that uh, make them fully degradable yeah uh, it's not like it's easily but it less time only but it's okay we, we move uh, slowly we move slowly slowly but, surely. Uh, slowly but surely they say yeah uh. hopefully the answer sister anis yeah okay Hope okay that I have a question your... from dr snow if i'm not mistaken oh. yes uh, uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> very uh, very good uh, presentation from 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 you and also from the the, the first group also. And also, uh, I noted that you put uh, a point that uh, you uh, you can find uh, plastic in the deepest uh, place in the in, uh, in, in the ocean. <clears throat> Uh, it's a very good uh, way uh, to, 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 to 
attract the audience. Um, maybe related to the point, um, I would like to ask, uh, since when this these uh, plastics uh, is uh, you know present uh, in the in the ocean? Since when do you think uh, it has uh, accumulated in the ocean, and how long it takes? Uh, uh, for the plastic to be um, uh, to, to be deposited in the deeper space of the ocean in, in, in that uh, case. Okay, um, thank you very much, Doctor, uh, for the question. So I think uh, the uh, since when the plastic started to accumulate is started from a very long time ago. Uh, so from the first uh, revolution of uh, no <laughs> revolution of what we call that industrial Indus industrial revolution. I think it already started the the mass production of plastic. Ah uh, yes, mass production of plastic. Mm. So since since there, I think uh, the 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 people uh, throw plastic in the ocean. So uh, if you ask how many years mm -hmm. does it takes from Google, uh, it say approximately four hundred and fifty years uh, to decompose a single plastic bag. Uh, if if the plastic bag is fully what we call that uh, on, on the soil, if fully. Kambus, the kamb no, no, no. Uh, it, it, it fully tetanam, tetanam, tetanam. Uh, deposit. Ah, uh, deposit into the soil. Ah, uh, then it take approximately four hundred and fifty years. But in the case of plastic debris on the ocean, it would take longer because uh, the the plastic will uh, flow in the ocean and do not really submerge into the soil. Uh, so that's a very uh, problem. Uh, it's very problematic. Uh, I hope that answer Doctor's question. <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Let us know and then about the answer. Uh, I think Brother Hassan has lots of backup in, uh, in, at the back. Uh, so good. Uh. Okay, uh, and, and then maybe I would like uh, to add that I think the first plastic from all the point, the first plastic that has been born during that industrial revolution uh, still exists until now, based on the point of uh, this group. Okay, thank you so much. Group two, we, we now move to the next group, which is on the toxin or radioactive discharge. And this is actually from Sister Hanim, Sita Biba, and also Sita Lia. Okay, uh, you please proceed. The floor is yours. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and good morning. Uh, today, we are going to talk about radioactive discharge. So generally, the radioactive discharge is a sort of hazardous waste that contains radioactive substances. But first thing first, I would like to introduce our team members, which is me, Nur Shabila Hanim, Binti Mama Hamidi, Nur Alia Elina Binti Abdul Hakam, and also Habiba Fatmishia. This is what we are going to talk. We will talk about the introduction, the case study of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, and also the conclusion which include methodology and problem solving. It seems that almost every day, there's another story about pollution of one form or another form. Very often of our own actions lead to that pollution and in many cases, we actually can do better about it. So what is radioactive discharge? Here is a little bit of explanation of the background of radioactive discharge. 
Since 1952, low levels of radioactive waste have been discharged into the Irish Sea, the English Channel, and the Arctic Ocean. It is recognized that radioactive material needs to be isolated and encased, whether in glass or concrete, to prevent leakage on the ocean floor. And it is now kept on land for some time whilst radioactivity levels decrease. So what long-term effects might this have on marine environments? Certainly, radiation can enter the food chain in through plankton. Next, the radiation can go on to cont contaminate fish. Radioactive cesium and plutonium has already been found in seals and propoise in the Irish Sea. Next, I will explain uh, the factors of radioactive discharge. Radioactive discharge originate from several different sources and uh, the most common one is related to the nuclear industry. Radioactive discharge is a result of many forms of activities including nuclear medicine, nuclear research, nuclear power regeneration, rare earth mining and also nuclear weapons reprocessing. Other than that, the factors of nuclear is the radioactive discharge is educa educational establishments, hospitals, waste handling and disposal facilities, and lastly, oil and gas industry. Radioactive discharge, uh, the storage and disposal of radioactive discharge is really regulated by the government agencies. And in order to protect human health and environment, it must be stored and disposed correctly. The radioactive discharge can remain for a few months, uh, years, and also it can remain for hundreds of years, and the level of radioactive can vary. The radioactive waste is extremely toxic as it can remain for so, so long and can cause acute radiation, acute radiation sickness when it first come out from the reactor if we stood within a few meters from the reactor while it was unshielded. So next, I will pass to the next presenter, Alia. <laughs> okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good day to everyone. Uh, okay, I'll be with you guys uh, on this part of the presentation and I'll be talking about the current issue uh, of the case study. So uh, we have chosen um, about the Japan's um, irresponsible decision to dump um, toxic and radioactive waste into the ocean. So a little, a little context, um, there's a nuclear power plant in Japan called the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. And before tragedy like struck them, um, Japan already decided to dump uh, its uh, radioactive discharge into the ocean as they already excavate um, the seabed so it can act as a pathway for the discharge to go through. Uh, and then in 2011, there was a tsunami that was caused by an earthquake that hit the nuclear power plant as well as destroying it in the process. Now, um, there's this one company in uh, Japan called the Tokyo Electric Power Company. Um, they just let the um, radioactive discharge uh, flow into the sea. However, after severe criticism and a lot of pressure from their own citizens and um, people from abroad, they decided to stop the flowing um, discharge into the ocean temporarily. So when that happened, Japan decided to build tanks that would hold uh, the contaminated discharge. However, the tank can only store about 1.37 million cubic meter of water and uh, is expected to be full by uh, 2023. Now, this created a huge problem because Japan still stands strong with the decision to um, release the toxic uh, discharge and radioactive discharge into the sea. Uh, then the, uh, the, Japanese, uh, the Japan government uh, said that the radio radioactive uh, discharge would be treated by using some kind of purification method, which indicated that it will help dilute the um, discharge. So um, during uh, 2018, uh, they found out that a 2017 uh, study uh, about the case that um, not only that this radioactive discharge 
contain tritinum, but it also contain uh, cobalt 60, uh, carbon 14, and strontium 90, which is all very harmful for living things uh, in a very huge amount. But in that same study, they also discovered that one liter of um, radioactive discharge will actually need 254 liters of clean tea waters to be actually diluted. Um, and everybody knows how long uh, a radioactive uh, discharge needs to like be half life. But in this um, in this study, they also found out that um, in order for it to be diluted, it only took, uh, in all it will only take uh, thirty years to be actually completely diluted. So, um, what will happen if we just let this go on? Um, actually, what will happen is that the seawater will be contaminated as the uh, incident of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant will actually be enough to actually con contaminate uh, the Pacific Ocean and beyond it. Uh, with that, this will actually um, will affect marine life and human life as it will somehow alter the DNA of living things. So the question remains, what do we do? All right. So there are ways to solve this problem, but like not, how do I say this? Like completely. So firstly, is speed up the radio radioactive decay. So what is radioactive decay? So radioactive decay is actually a random process by which an unstable atomic uh, nucleus loses its energy by emission of radiation or even particles. So uh, over here, I, we put that um, they use this one state called the beta decay inbound state, uh, which means that when all of the electrons in a uranium uh, atom are stripped away, the atom becomes fully ionized and the beta decay electron can go straight to the K shell instead of flying away because it is no longer blocked by electrons. What it, uh, what it means here is that since radioactive um, materials is very like, I mean, okay, it's easily to be, not explode, but you get what I mean, it's like, uh, it's, uh, it has like, it contains like very excited uh, electrons. So some, uh, at some point it will like pop like that, not pop, but explode, yeah. Uh, so what it's trying to, um, what, it's, what it means here is that if we speed up the radioactive decay, then, um, instead of like flying away and it be exploded, they, they will just be stabilized. Okay, and then next is neutralize the radioactive discharge. So, um, since we know that uh, it's not possible to like stop a process from being radioactive, the uh, radioactive discharge to be more radioactive, like there's no way to like, prevent or stop that, but we can, it is possible to, uh, how do you say this, control the radioactive uh, discharge by neutralizing it. So uh, this is because a radioactive source's potential damage is proportional to its distance, uh, duration, and intensity, uh, and the dosage actually matters. Uh, when a particular atom is ready, it will decay. The amount of time that will pass before uh, it decays can be assigned a probability. So what this point means right here is that if we were to put uh, the right chemicals or right uh, things into the radioactive discharge, then there's a possibility that it can also be uh, stabilized faster. And um, that's why it said that uh, the there's like a probability. That's why it said that the dosage matters because like there is a way for it to be uh, stabilized faster. Uh, so if by doing these two, there is a way to like, um, sorry, if we actually uh, do the speed up the radioactive decay and neutralize the radioactive decay, then, uh, sorry, discharge, uh, then uh, it's safe to say that it can finally meet up with the radioactive chain N. So um, radioactive chain N, I'm sorry, radioactive chain N uh, is actually a, um, it's like a final stage for uh, the radioactive materials to decay. So that's all for me. I will pass this on to my next presenter. Okay. Uh, thank you for passing to me.
Uh, I'll continue with more details. So how do we solve this problem? As a prequisitive uh, to uh, effective waste management, sources and waste must be fully defined in radiological, chemical, biological, and physical terms. So all waste minimization and proper waste management should be fundamental goals of any waste management program. In that way, the amount of waste can be reduced. Let us take a look at the diagram shown. This figure shows the steps for managing radioactive waste according to the IAEA, International Atomic Energy Agency, 2001. This detailed sequence of steps includes radioactive waste minimization, pretreatment, characterization, treatment, conditioning, transport, storage, and disposal. Eventually, to ensure that each waste is correctly handled and the final waste from form has the required qualities, all quality assurance requirements should be defined for all steps of the waste management process. Let us move on to the next slide. So in conclusion, let me sum up our main points. Radioactive materials are widely used in industrial and scientific settings, as well as in medical, agricultural, and other environmental applications. This radioactive waste will undoubtedly be generated during the production and usage of these products. Uh, as my group mate earlier stated that several countries, including Japan, are pouring poisons and other dangerous wastes into the water, uh, which is negatively impacting our marine life. So uh, chemicals like oil, mercury, lead, pesticides, and other heavy metals uh, can contaminate water supplies and our food chain by damaging marine life. This has an impact not only on aquatic life, but also on humans. When people are exposed to this harmful compounds for an extended period of time, it can cause serious health problems such as hormone imbalances, reproductive disorders, and damage to our neurological systems and kidneys. So who is responsible for this? Uh, I guess we all know the answer. Uh, as they say, your actions dictate the consequences or whatever goes around comes around. So that brings to the end of our presentation. Thank you all for listening. We are open to any questions. Thank you so much for the group, Sister, uh, Sister Hanim, Sister Habiba, and Sister Alia. So I put up for any, any question from the floor, but I, I, would, I heard two times in a row, and not in a row, two times of karma for today. What goes around will goes around. <laughs> so it will. Pollution is always like that. Okay, there is a question from who is that? Uh, let us know. Yes, let us know. Uh, he's waving his hand. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Fahad, uh, for allowing me to, <laughs> to ask another question. Uh, but in this case, for this, uh, the third group. Um, it is actually interesting uh, topic also uh, about the radioactive uh, discharge, um, but um, I think um, is that uh, do you think uh, there are better ways of managing the um, uh, radioactive discharge from the you know? Uh, I mean the uh, transformation or the development of the discharge uh, handling from the beginning of the uh, era of uh, uh, the radioactivity era up to now or in the future. Do you think there's a significant uh, improvement in terms of the uh, the technology? Uh, yeah, handling the radioactive discharge. Uh, sorry, so the question is, uh, how are there better ways to handle radioactive discharge, right? Yes, yes. Um, personally, I think there is by um, <laughs> uh, banning nuclear tests uh, or uh, 
and proper labeling uh, and proper method of disposing uh, radioactive waste. But personally, for in my opinion, um, the like the the whole thing that I talked about, uh, how like they have to put um some chemicals inside the uh radioactive discharge to actually be, uh, actually be diluted. For me, I think personally, um, yes, it's true that we cannot like stop it or like be, uh, the radioactive discharge to be completely gone, but we can make it uh, apa, uh, dilute it so that it won't be dangerous. Or uh, since like there's a lot of like, let's say uh, there, come, well, there will come a time where like there's a lot of diluted uh, radioactive uh, active discharge maybe we can use that and use it uh, for like everyday living like um like there are some uh, radioactive materials that we use nowadays right like cobalt uh, 16 carbon 14 um so maybe we can use that in in that way yeah hopefully it it answer that your question let us know yeah, uh, uh, I think this yes, is uh, a part. <laughs> uh, <laughs> some some part of the comment is is uh, I think uh, good enough. Lah. Okay then, thank you so much. Oh, this a question from Sister Uni. One second. Right. Uh, I so, think this question uh, is, is not only limited for the, the, the previous group. Uh, I mean, so Dr. Jika, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is like a general question. Um, is nuclear energy is considered as one of the circular, can be put in the circular economy? Circular economy, that means that every, the, the byproduct should go back to production. So if it wasn't, uh, or if nuclear energy can't be in the circular economy, is it possible that it will be banned in the future instead of, you know, promoting more research to actually um, how handle the nuclear? Because in, in my perspective, nuclear energy is so cost consuming despite of the large energy produced, but it also very consuming. Look at how they have to manage it. It's also cost consuming and so forth. So the question is, is nuclear can be in the circular economy? And if cannot, is it possibly will be banned in the future? Perhaps I want to comment on this. Um, uh, as you know, uh, for the uh, uh, atomic material uh, throughout the whole uh, world, uh, it has a, a specific body, a specific body to to monitor and to explore the um, the capabilities and also the um, uh, yeah for the future yeah uh, called as uh, IAEA um, and Malaysia also one of the um uh, representative uh, in this uh, agency yeah so um uh, that's why maybe related to my question also just now uh, nuclear technology um is actually at the moment uh, perhaps not at the level that that uh, that uh, um it's, it uh, it has uh uh, to improve because probably it's just like uh, still in the beginning uh, in the beginning but uh, because of the potential because of the potential of the uh, nuclear energy um, but uh, at the moment I think uh, the understanding is not at the at that level that uh, we can consider uh, to be safe, really safe to be um, to be used. But in the future, yes, uh, there's of course uh, there will be uh, more advanced uh, technology and uh, advanced uh, um, understanding that can uh, cope with the potential and the limitation of the uh, nuclear uh, nuclear technology. Um, perhaps uh, that's my general comment lah, if you <laughs> to add the one. Yeah, I think I think most, most of the people they uh, I, I think you you all mariners you know much about this one. But the people are not knowing about the 
about the information is about this radiative. I mean, like radiations, accumulation of radiation depends on the degree of exposure and also half life of the elements. And they they would think that uh, I think let's relate with the disaster of Fukushima. Right? After the Fukushima happens, uh, disaster, I find I'm mistaken, the market at Hong Kong, uh, the market at Hong Kong, they said they put an ads there. This fish is not from Japan. This fish is, uh, is this fish is actually from other uh, other country lah, UK or uh, whatsoever. Okay, so they're afraid of that. Is uh, I think this group also has talked about the dilution, about that thing. So it actually answered that uh, people are not knowing. Well, this is the fear of unknown. Uh, people will fear something that that it is not uh, knowing about, and the. The, uh, the nuclear technology is the is the future actually. I mean, it's not the future right now. It's it's already happened. Uh, our our nation, just like Dr. Snow said, that we are not there yet. We are not utilize uh, all all resources for this uh, for this particular technology because in 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 terms of size, if you talk in terms of size uh, for the nuclear nuclear technology, it's only consists of very small sizes. Instead of you are using all resources such as oil and everything that uh, will make more much more pollutions, you you cannot uh, say much about uh, natural disaster like, like Fukushima. I mean that is beyond our control. But like uh, just now, IEA is a uh, is an international agency that control this one. They are very good in this. I mean like even our rare earth processing plant at Gebeng area is also is under IEA agency they are being monitored under that if that had uh, happened such as disaster of thing that is beyond our control but of course as a human side we are putting everything uh, every risk to be controlled uh, and then that is so good that it can be uh, putting inside the circular economy next to ensure that we are not putting uh, as a non renewable sources now for this one okay uh, I, I think I saw Sister Alia uh, waving his hand, uh, her hands. Uh, yeah, I, I do have a question. Since uh, Dr. Faiz was it say, said that the nuclear energy is the future, so um, I want uh, your opinion on like, is it worth it? Like, is it worth the risk to have nuclear energy? Seeing like how our world is right now. <laughs> worth in terms of the resources of the energy or the the income or money things both the the person can you put inside is the expert in this actually um yeah uh, uh, because this is a very big discussion <laughs> we can make this it's a debate a now. Good discussion and it's a, maybe a debate <laughs> but um uh that the whole world is uh, looking at this uh, as a potential, which means um, there's a significant benefit. Um, significant benefits. If you um, see like a, a movie, uh, for example, Back to the Future, that using uh, nuclear power uh, as the, the uh, uh, as the um, source for the car uh, i mean <clears throat> don't you want that if you, if you if the the energy the 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 the, the, the technology is safe uh, up to that level which means you can bring inside your car uh, so um just imagine uh if that is happening so the potential is there but the understanding the um, the science need to be also very advanced that movie maybe just put on the idea just throw some idea but uh, how to do that is uh is the challenge for the scientists for us also that's my general comment also. 
Dr. Faiz, you want to add something? Okay, uh, regarding with the nuclear energy and whatsoever, uh, actually the world is now is uh, identifying fossil fuel as the main culprit for climate change. Eh? So we are trying to move away from over dependency on apa, fossil fuel. So we are trying to venture on uh, so many uh, potential uh, alternative energy like what what they did for Tesla, they they are using batteries to 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 for cars. So nuclear is a is a basically nuclear is safe, it's very clean. But uh, if if uh, if anything happen, of course lah, it will catastrophic lah. But if it managed properly, it, will, it is a very clean energy and have so many potential. Imagine you can have a uh, one big uh, apa. Uh, size of a uh, uranium of a uh, of a class, you can power up up to the whole peninsula. So how how many how many apa banyak banyak yang kita boleh jimat lah sebenarnya kat situ. But of course lah, uh, the uh, for my opinion eh, the the gang gang fossil fuel ni gang gang oil and gas ni not happy with this uh, development. So maybe they, they, that's why the cost is very high and everything. But uh, if we are very serious to combat the climate change, if we are very serious to meet the demand, the target of 1.5 degrees, so we need to consider all this uh, nuclear energy or hydrogen energy and everything as an alternative for fossil fuel because it is already proven that fossil fuel is the main culprit for the climate change. So. Uh, we need to take the risk uh, to to make sure that uh, we can live uh, within the the 1.5 degrees lah, as uh, as suggested by IPCC and U United Nations. Uh, so that's that's the thing lah. You cannot take uh, you cannot apa apa nama take a leap of apa. We need to take risk lah to 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 for a better future. Uh, so. So, tengoklah berapa ramai yang willing to take the risk. Okay. okay. That's okay. my so opinion. Back, thank you, Dr. Faiz. It's all back to the basic of, of things. I mean, like, if you wanted to run something, you must take it very seriously. You must manage it very seriously. Even if we talk about fossil fuel, I mean, like, you have lots of things like oil spill and things that comes from there. So, that is because of the management is failed there. So it's the same as reality. It's a safe energy. It's just that the management must be very good. And other things such as uh, the, the things that are beyond, uh, such as natural disasters, of course, it's beyond our control. OK, so do not worry. Uh, OK, and then I don't want to take so much time on this one. Is everything OK about this one? Or I go to the next group? OK, uh, OK, good. Uh, it's good we have some discussion here. And uh, we are playing with time also right now. So I'm calling for the next group, which is uh, oh, oil spill. Oh, it's good. You just mentioned about me. Okay, so oil spill group, please, from Sister Shifa and Sister Nuha. Okay, please proceed. The floor is yours. Um, hi, Assalamualaikum, everyone. Uh, firstly, let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Nushika Shatita Damajais, and my partner is Anwazli Uh We will be presenting about oil spill. Okay, what is oil spill? An oil spill is the release of a liquid petroleum hydrocarbon into the environment especially the marine ecosystem, due to human activity and is a form of solution. So basically, when we talk about oil spill, it must be come from tankers and ships. Spills of refined petroleum, oil refuse always are. This issue can lead to water pollution and of course poses a problem for marine life. Next. Yeah, next thing. Oil spill, aka oil pollution. It is because oil spill can cause the pollution to marine environment, can cause danger to 
the marine life. So that's why OSPI can also be defined as algorithm nets. So as we can see here, uh, this sources of algorithm can come 45% from effluents, atmosphere, dealing with 35% from shipping, 10% of tank to disaster, 5% of material sources, and other 5% from undefined. So these sources of all pollution can be caused by people making mistakes, being careless, equipment breaking down, natural disasters such as hurricane, high winds, or deliberate acts by terrorists, acts of war, or illegal dumping. So cargo cargo tanker washing at sea, and internet discharge of oily wastes from tank washing and accidental spillage can be caused by uh, people making mistakes or being careless, uh, right? Uh, or others, oil leakage from pipeline. It can be because uh, maybe they didn't um, check properly uh, at the pipelines. Okay, beach pumping at sea. Beach pumping at sea, jam ship use it to um, uh, illegally dump toxic waste in the ocean and it called beach dumping. And it is one of illegal dumping. Okay. Import or loses. Collision in part. There is one case reported near Johor. There are two ships collide and it triggered major oil spill. So, this one can cause a uh, major oil spill. Uh. Uh, next, tanker accident and marine accident due to collision, fire explosion, or grounding. Next, blow out of wells, disposal of drilling mud, accidental damages to offshore drilling waste can be caused by equipment breaking down. Lastly, oil wastes from oil fields or refineries near cause. Next slide, please. Okay, the impacts. The impacts can be divided to two categories, to marine life and commercial damage. Af okay, after a spill, since oil is less than water, so it will be float on the surface of the water. Uh, and it doesn't just stay there uh, in some big cloak. What usually happens is that uh, the oil will rapidly spread out over the surface of the water until it becomes a thin layer and is known as oil slick. Then it keeps spreading out until it forms a super thin layer called a sheen. This super thin layer can cause a big problem to the marine environment, marine life. Okay, first, the birds. The birds can lose the water repellency of their feeders, then cause thermal insulation loss. Okay, without proper insulation, they can end up dying from hypothermia. And if they try to clean themselves, they might ingest some of that oil. So they will die. Can okay. ingest some oil to um okay in mangrove. Um, because oxygen enters a mangrove through lantica, so if lantica crush, oxygen level in sediment it drops. Hmm. Uh, others with vegetation sequest pests are killed or thoroughly invaded, and for plankton export that export to water soluble components, leaching, and for commercial damage. Mortality of fish reduction in cage because many fish affected by the oil spill, they will die. So it will reduce in cage that of fish, eggs, and larvae, even though the other the adult fish can successfully make eggs. The oil can negatively impact egg and larvae survival. So, 
body ache. Tourism become nice, avoided by beach goers and lost revenue because the beach no longer uh, beautiful. There is uh, some damage. So beach goers will not come to that place. Again, right. Loss of sensitive marine habitats. Uh, for example, mangrove. Mangrove is one of the habitats for shrimp, crabs, uh, mudskipper fish. So if marine, if mangrove, if also affect the mangroves, so it will also affect the habitat for aquatic animals. So lastly, loss of flora and fauna of the star, flora and fauna, the animals and the uh, plants. Okay, next slide. As we can see here, this is the cycle of what happened to marine environment or marine life during oil spills or how the oil can end up in the ocean. So, hmm, this ship here, uh, it describes about the oiling can result in the loss of sport shipping opportunities. So this is where the oil comes from, how the oil can end up in the ocean. Okay, next, waste and currents to ocean fronts bringing together all these persons and sugarcane communities causing prolonged floating oil exposure. So, so for those young tatau, for those that didn't know what is sugarcane, sugarcane is a, the type of seaweed, a brown seaweed. Uh, daughters, dolphins, and birds that inhale all the vapors will may, may cause acute and chronic acid effect. Next, heavy oily at surface for sergasm, particularly marine juvenile turtles, crabs, and many other animals. Because of that super thin layer uh, oil spit oil that cover the surface. Um, it affect the juvenile turtles, crabs, and other animals. So next, heat builds up in the dark oiled surface, causing thermal stress to animals in sagasum. Thermal stress means they directly impress uh, the cellular function in various tissues of the body, body, as well as the reduction in food intake, which ultimately re result in reduction huge production performance. So it will affect the production of the animals. Uh, okay, as we can see the turtles here, it ingests the floating oil and contaminated prey. So for la, the turtle to Okay. Next, oil dissolved into the water column can be toxic to fish, crabs, and other sensitive species. For example, a dark fish can experience fin erosion when exposed to oil, as well as reduced growth rates and enlarged liquids. Next, it dissolves oxygen in the water. As oil remains floating on the water surface, it will block the light or sunshine that can enter the water so it will uh, it will reduce the dissolved oxygen level in the water and suffocates marine organism. Okay, next sagasum followed by oil and this person can see living sagasum dependent animals without food and covered and vulnerable to predators. It also transfers oil to bottom communities. And lastly, that oil animals missing I pass to know how for the next slide. You should, you should have until around well, five minutes, yeah? Four minutes, something essentially. Please proceed, Noha. Okay. <laughs> sorry, okay. sorry. Okay, hi everyone. So we'll now continue with some example of oil pollution cases that happened. So I'm going to show you a video and this video is going to 
show us about oil pollution that happened in Pantai Sherman Port Dyson in 2020. 2020. All right. The Department of Environment DOE is investigating an oil spill at Pantai Cermin Batu 10 near Port Dickson, which has polluted about 3 kilometers of the coast. State Health Environment Cooperatives and Consumerism Committee Chairman S. Virapan said oil samples have been taken and will be sent to the Department of Chemistry to determine the cause of the spill. He said cleanup work is being conducted and advised members of the public not to visit the beach until the process is completed. The Department of Environment DOE is <laughs> investigating an oil Present. <laughs> Alright, I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay, based on the news, uh, it can be seen that the beach was polluted uh, by a mysterious oil spill. Uh, or because because nobody knows uh, who did it and from where the the oil came because it just happened there in one day. So uh, this is one case. Another case in 2019 at Tanjung Bala Johu, it was reported that uh, foreign tankers were believed to have dumped marine pool oil that resulted in the spill. And it was estimated that um, 300 tons of marine pool oil has been discharged and the spill covered an area about four nautical miles from the coast. So, uh, if you notice that it may be hard to detect exactly who spills the oil. So, in, okay, in a report on the Malaysian coastal uh, marine resources, our country is said to have experienced about 18 major oil spill incidents. Uh, and a study by a research pointed out that the main cause of this would be oil discharge from ships. So in Malaysia, we know uh, how busy the streets of Malacca are uh, with some famous port like Port Klang. And in port like this, uh, you will find that the oil charge is unavoided because ship maintenance will involve the process of pumping out waste from the ship. And for your information, uh, one ship could generate about 150,000 tons of oil waste. So you guys just imagine lah how many tons of oil are released into the sea on a daily basis. All right, so moving on is spill content. <laughs> moving on is spill containment method. Okay, there are plenty ways to handle oil spills, such as boom skimmers in situ burning. So what is booms? Okay, booms are actually uh, floating uh, physical barriers to oil made of plastic, metal, or other material, which slow the spread of oil and keep it contaminated. And you can see from the picture uh, below that the boom is placed across a narrow entrance to the ocean uh, so that the oil cannot pass through it. So uh, there are also many types of bo booms, which, uh, for example, like, a diaper like material boom that trap the oil spill. So it's like a, the, the diaper that baby use, something like that. But it is to adopt the oil. All right. Next is skimmers. Okay, skimmers are boats and other devices that can remove oil from the sea surface before it reach sensitive area along coastline. So oil is being skimmed from the sea surface by a vessel of opportunity. And sometimes are two boats will tow a collection boom, allowing oils to concentrate within the boom where it is picked up by a skimmer. So a simple way uh, is function like a vacuum cleaner to suck out of water. All right, next is in situ burning of oil seed. Okay, burn and uh, oil seed are part of six before it reach the coast. Okay. What is oil seed? Okay, oil seed is a layer of oil that is floating on the sea because it has accidentally come out of a ship or container. So to do this, okay, response, responders gather some of the oil from the sea in a fireproof bomb and then set the fire up. Okay, this technique works best when the oil is fresh and the weather relatively calm. So it's literally burning the oil on the water and it's not really eco-friendly lah. All right. 
The other method is this person. Correct. Oh, okay. okay, this person. Okay, this person is uh, using uh, aircraft or boats to apply this person, which is a uh, chemical that disperses the oil into the water column. So that uh, let's stay at the surface uh, where it could affect beaches and tide flat. So it is using chemicals to break up the oils. And Malaysia sometimes use this and even have a guideline for this. All right. Next is uh, using bioremediation, which is uh, using a microorganism to eat up the oil. Okay, bioremediation is an alternative to clean up action that is safer for the environment than other chemical or physical solution. And the other methods uh, is by handheld tools, just like using hand, rakes, and shelves. Okay, this method was used because the amount of area affected by the oil spill from the incidents weren't that huge, and the oil spill are still management, manageable manually. So, uh, all right, so we know that there are many methods to clean up the oil, but, but huh, can oil be completely removed from the ocean? So the answer is no. Uh, we cannot completely remove uh, oil from the ocean because um, <laughs> because uh, even when the oil is removed from the surface of water, uh, it may have already degraded and penetrated into marine habitat. And when, when this happens, uh, it, it can be really difficult to remove the oil. But still, uh, prevention is better than cure. Cure. So what we can do? Um, <laughs> so what it's, we it's can? A, it's do already. Is, um, it's already time. Time. We just to prevent the oil spill even work. when we are using the small boat because oil spill from small vessels. Uh, when you multiply this volume by the thousand of fishing and uh, recreational boats on the water, and uh, they compose the larger source of oil pollution. But the first. What we can do is we should know the capacity of the tank to avoid overflow while refueling and leaving some room for fuel expansion. All right, next we can tighten bolts on engine to prevent oil leaks. All right, next outfit your engine with an oil tray or drip pan. See, uh, for the oil tray, you don't need any fancy or expensive uh, because uh, based on what based on what I read. A cookie tray or a painting tray will do the trick also, right? Okay, next use an absorbent pad of or a full coiler to catch drips. All right. Uh, we should always keep a absorbent pad. So if spills do happen, it is important that uh, the boat manage it, manage them efficiently. So the spill should immediately be contained and cleaned up with the absorbent pads or boom to to prevent the spread. So for the conclusion, our future, our decisions, so we have to save ourselves. We have to now decide how our future and we can generate a positive social and environmental change is. So we can still choose to build a better, more sustainable future for us and the planet. And it is, too, it is not too late to address climate change and others. And always remember that there is no planet B. All right, thank you. Any question? Okay, thank you so much, Sister Shifa and Sister Noha. Okay, there is no planet B, but everyone is going to Mars. Can after this, Elon Musk has started the space science program, uh, so there will be no planet C after this. Are uh, you 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 actually have have exceed much of the time? Uh, so. Any question from the floor, if anyone? On my side, actually, I just want to ask about that Fort Dixon and Tanjung Balau. So which method that actually we apply for that? That, that six method that you, you just presented right now. So, uh, for upper to Fort Dixon, we uh. use the boom, the boom method. Uh, they use okay. the diaper boom, uh, the absorber boom. Lah. They use okay. the absorber boom, which is like, like the diaper material like something like that. Like for the uh, Tanjung tu, for Zoho, they use the skimmers which they vacuum the oil from the surface. Okay, so good. 
Anything from the floor, if anyone to ask, or else I will proceed with the next group. Okay, thank you so much, Sister Noah and Sister Shifa. Okay, the next group coming for Sister Dawia. Uh, Sister Dawia on the agriculture or uh, you, you, yep, you can share your slide. Okay. Yes, uh, uh, okay. This PDF, right? Okay. Yes. Oh. Um. Ah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, today I'm um, uh, I'm Adawiya and Zaira going to present to you guys about the agricultural and of okay we are going to tell you guys what are the definition causes and impact and the contrast strategies for the agriculture rank off. So what's the, the definition of agriculture rank off? Um, agriculture rank off is water from farm field due to irrigation rain um, or methods snow that flows flows over the earth that can absorb the into the ground, into bodies of water or evaporate. This runoff can contain pesticide sediments such as um, soil particles, nutrient like phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium from fertilizers and metals, which can uh, contaminate source of water. For deeper understanding, Okay. For the person, the agriculture runoff is typically a non-point source uh, pollution, which, uh, which means it is hard to exactly locate um, uh, where the pollution comes from, like uh, you guys see in the slide, in the diagram. This is because the runoff picks up other pollutants throughout its travel until it reaches its final location, typically a body of water. Like uh, the receiving water, right? Um, uh, it's also can occur uh, because of improper management of animal feedings, operations from excessively uh, application of pesticide, irrigation water, and fertilizer. Um, as agriculture and cough into body of water, it can have uh, negative impacts on the environment. Not only it can contaminate source of drinking water, but uh, the chemical in the fertilizer can be absorbed into the aquatic plants, contribute to algae blooms, and affect animals' ability um, to find food and reproduce. Um, this impact can be reduced by adapting management uh, practice to local condition. This practice can include implementing nutrient management plants using high efficient irrigation equipment and limiting pest, uh, pesticide use. Um, moving on. Um, how does the agriculture um surface water that flows uh, from farms? Uh, with storm water, melt water, and irrigation. It ends up in nearby streams, river lakes, and wetlands, potential, um, and wetlands that potentially causing uh, flooding and water pollution. Okay. Uh, the following are contaminants um, commonly found in agriculture runoff. The first one is sediment. The most uh, Um, prevalent source of agriculture was off field. 
uh, rainwater carries uh, soil particles um, like sediments and dumps them in the water, reducing the amount of sunlight that reaches the aquatic plants. It can also clog the gills of fish or smooth the fish lar uh, larvae. Uh, next, uh, nutrient. Um, this is caused uh, because farmers apply nutrients such as phosphorus, nutrient, potassium in the form of chemical fertilizer, manure, and sludge. Uh, they may also grow legumes and leaf crop uh, residues to enhance production. Uh, when these sources uh, exceed plant needs or are applied uh, just before it rains, nutrients can watch into aquatic ecosystem. And there, they can cause algae bloom, which can ruin swimming and boating opportunities, um, create full taste, and order in drinking water and kill fish. High concentration in nitric in drinking water can cause metamoglobinemia, um, which is a potentially fatal disease in infants, also known as blue baby syndrome. To combat nutrient uh, losses, a uh, farmer can implement nutrient management plans that help maintain high yields and save money on fertilizer. Um, and the uh, uh, pathogen, uh, bacteria, viruses, and other harmful organics from so uh, source such as animal waste, such a uh, runoff, maybe fire waste management system. So, oh. um, the fourth one is pesticide, um, pesticide and herbicide, which is a uh, chemical and organic pesticide, a common solution are pesticide that uh, are biodegradable sites uh, that they are quickly broken down uh, by exposure to the elements and micro into a relatively harmless com compounds. Uh, um, insecticide, herbicide and fungicide uh, are used uh, to these chemicals can enter and contaminate water through direct application, runoff, and atmospheric deposition. Um, they can poison fish and wildlife, contaminate food source, and destroy the habitat that animals use for a uh, protective cover. Um, besides, to reduce contamination from pesticide, farmers should use integrate pest uh, management, which is IPM techniques, based on the specific soil, climate, pest history, and Crop condition for partic uh, particular field. Um, IPM encourage natural barriers and limits pesticide use and manage necessary application to minimize pesticide movement from the field. Um, and furthermore, the metals. Metal uh, basically are uh, from sources such as fertilizer and manu uh, manure. And the last one is salt. Um, basically, salt uh, come from um, from on agriculture of mineral rich irrigation water. This can be reduced with efficient irrigation that give crops no more uh, than they need. So basically, salt uh, uh, come from the evap water um, during day. Um, so I pass the presentation to the next um, presenter. Yeah. All right. Uh, what does this do to the water? All right. First, uh, it triggers algae uh, blooms. Second, produce dead zones. Third, pollutes drinking water. And lastly, harms the fish. Next slide. Next slide. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Okay. What? Uh. So, what is an algae blooms, and why is it bad? Okay. Phosphorus in the water cause uh algae to grow at a rapid pace, which turns the water green and cloudy. Causes issues with odor, deprives the water of oxygen, essentially suffocating suffocating the fish and creating dead zones. Okay. Dead zone. Uh. So, what is a dead zone then? Next slide. Okay, a dead zone is an area of water that is completely deprived of oxygen, allowing for virtually no fish or other marine life to be able to survive. All right, next slide. Okay, how does it pollute the drinking water? The obvious answer is that pollutants drain into our above green water source. However, another problem is water being leached through the soil down into our groundwater and contaminating the water we drink. Okay, what happens if we drink this water? This water contains too much nitrogen as nitrate, which for infants can be fatal. Young children and adults have an enzyme that fight uh, fight off this condition. Infants, however, don't have this enzyme and can contract blue baby syndrome that Adawiya say earlier, which restrict the transportation of oxygen into the bloodstream. Next slide. All right. Uh, so there are three main control strategies for agricultural run of pollution. First, source control, second, process control, and lastly, and treatment. Okay, source control works to reduce the application of nitrogen and phosphorus, as well as leaching, such as conservation tillage. Conservation tillage, fertilization management, and water saving irrigation. Okay, let me further explain about conservation tillage. Conservation tillage method is such such as reduced tillage and no tillage. It plays uh, it play a role in protecting soil from erosion, improve soil structure, and increase organic matter content, uh, which can increase infiltration to runoff ratio and reduce evaporation. Reduced tillage and no tillage are both effective methods of conservation tillage. Okay, fertilization, fertilization management. Okay, it is one example. Uh, one example of fertilization management is deep placement of fertilizers to lower the risk of discharging nitrogen into water. Okay, water saving irrigation. Okay, uh, it, it, uh, this is when rice growing season happens. Okay, we know that when rice growing season, it always coupled with rainy season, right? So, uh, surface runoff when rain season, surface runoff accounts for 86% of nitrogen losses. This is because uh, we use conventional flooding irrigation, we call CFI. CFI keeps a high flood water levels in the fields. So, the surface runoff with nitrogen. Okay, uh, flood, flooding irrigation is the type of surface irrigation uh, in which the soil is kept submerged and is truly flooded with water. So, uh, this water saving irrigation, this techniques, could reduce flood water levels, improving buffering capacity of the fields to help reduce runoff and nutrient losses. Okay, then process. Control. Process control aims to eliminate the pollutants by using the space and time of agricultural runoff from the fields to the receiving water, such as ecological ditch. Ecological ditch system is an engineered system that has been developed for the removal of agricultural runoff nutrients by sorption, sedimentation, transformation, plant uptake, uh, and microbial metabolic activities. 
okay um, they are they are usually uh, no no okay then end treatment and treatment is the last choice to avoid the damage of the receiving water if the pollutants does not fall below the safe value the last storage capacity provides more time for the treatment of agricultural runoff. Uh, although each approach is based on different principles, they serve to control agricultural runoff pollution to varying degrees. It is difficult to find efforts to integrate, integrate the diverse treatment options from source to end. But still, the concentration of nitrogen and phosphorus in agricultural runoff will decrease significantly by applying all these control techniques. You have one minute. Can you mute? Have you finished, Ms. Sister Zaira or Sister Abieto? Okay, um, for the conclusion, uh, the concentration of nitrogen and phosphorus in agriculture and off have decreased significantly by source control techniques. Uh, however, it is still difficult to achieve the safe discharge concentration because of long-term accumulation of nutrients in receiving water uh, will also increase the risk of eutrophication. Um, therefore, complete treatment of agriculture runoff still needs additional process control and end treatment technologies. That's all from our group. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Sister Rabiato and Sister Zahira. Okay, uh, from this presentation, I think this is how actually activities that are very far from the oceans can actually affect the oceans. Uh, so anything from the floor, if, if you want to ask, you can ask, you can wave your hands or you can do the chat box. On my side, actually, I was wondering actually, how is it this runoff issue to the oceans? in our country, in our Malaysia. Do you have any comment on that? Uh, any case in Malaysia? I think can you repeat in uh, easily understand? In, <laughs> in a simple manner. OK, the case of runoff in the Malaysia. Any comment on that? Simple. Any comment about the case in Malaysia? If you could relate that with your presentation just now. Uh, Dr. Adi asked, uh, um, basically, right off come from where? Good. Oh, yeah. yeah and, and any that from Malaysia? I was interested, keen to know in our region. Uh, I mean the factor. Oh, the place. Eh, 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 I mean. <laughs> oh, you see that in Chenbong, in Kelantan, could. if you know something from that. I, I was thinking what, what, what is the, you know, you, what, what you presented on us, the, the basic, uh, the, all the detail idea, but uh, to relate it, uh, is that happening in Malaysia? This runoff or in this unification or south or nutrient just now that you present, if any, hello, hello. Basically, um, there is uh, uh happen in Asia, but. The most cases uh, come from US. There is a uh, 40, 48 person 
uh, cases are come from US. That's uh, what I know. Yeah. To, to our ocean, it affected us. Selangor. Oh, Selangor. Can I add some information that I get from my father? Because my father is currently working in um, under the ID. So okay, he, good, good. Uh, please share. He quickly uh. tells me that uh, in Selangor, the project in Selangor already um, um, is not uh, the worst as in Kelantan because in Selangor, all the um, river in uh, river and off in the Selangor already managed. But in Kelantan is uh, the worst the worst scenario because um, uh, the, uh, my father said that um, uh, the, he, he gets a big job, a big project in Kelantan because um, before this, um, apa kerajaan pusat ni? Ah, kerajaan pusat tu uh, tak, I don't, have enough, uh, don't have enough money to manage the water uh, in Kelantan. So for now, as the government has changed, uh, so the government already uh, from 1,000 and then government add another until 1 billion uh, budget for for company for my father to manage um, uh, the project in uh, Sungai Kelantan at uh, Pumpat, if I'm not mistaken. And I think for now, when I went to Kelantan with my father, uh, he said that um, that uh, he currently managed for the river and uh, it's macam uh, sambung sikit dengan bahagian ocean tu. Uh, so, dia ada, ada juga lah macam, um, so there's a little bit macam um, disruption dekat bahagian ocean yang connect dengan river tu. Uh, I see, I see. Okay, good information. So hopefully that that, that project is success lah. I mean like uh, the, the the money is there because it consists of lots of lots of area to be covered. Uh, so yes, we pray for that project success. Okay, then uh, if there's no anything, I will call upon. Thank you so much, Sister Rabiatul and also Sister Zahira. And I would like to call upon the last presenter for today session, which is on microplastic topic. Uh, it should be from Brother Mio and Brother Fahmi Kot, right? Uh, both of you are the last one. Okay, please proceed. The floor is yours. Yeah, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, I hope you are still here because uh, the last one. So, yeah, uh, today we will talk about the microplastic. So, for the introduction, according to the NOAA, which is their long organization name, is US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And another organization that also involved in defining this microplastic term. Uh, define it as fragments of any type of plastic less than five millimeter in length. So in short, or uh, and generally, microplastic are uh, plastics that we hardly hardly see with our naked eyes. Next. So, microplastic, microplastic, um. Okay. Microplastic can be divided into two categories, which are primary and secondary. So, primary microplastics, uh, for your information, is any plastic fragments or particles that are already five millimeter in size or less before entering the environment. And for the secondary microplastics, they arise from the degradation of larger plastic products to natural weathering processes after entering the environment. So we see the, the difference that the primary before entering and the secondary is after entering the environment. So next slide. Okay. 
Ah, uh, Light time kerja. Light time kerja. Yeah. Kan, eh. Sorry, sorry. We have a. Oh, okay, nice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is an example of the primary microplastic, which is the um that microfibers which is microfibers are from the clothing and micro bits and the plastic pellets for your information which is micro bits are manufactured solid plastic particles of less than one millimeter in their largest dimension and the plastic pellets aka noodles are the building blocks for nearly every product made of plastic. So for the secondary microplastics, the examples of the microplastic is plastic bottles, fishing nets, and fire and tire wear. Next. So this is just additional knowledge to us, which is 35% of all ocean microplastics came from the textiles or clothing, primarily primarily due to the erosion of polyester, airy, acrylic or nylon based clothing often during the washing process. So uh, because we wash our clothing that made from the plastic, it can afford to the uh, pollution of the microplastic. Like pass yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So enough with definition and uh, summary about the uh, what is microplastic and let us talk about the real deal here. What is the threat brought by microplastic? So first, uh, microplastic will lead uh, is a threat because they have a long resident time and they are persistent organic pollutant and they also biolo biological integration in organism. They capable of to be a biological integration in organism. So what does long resident time and persistent organic pollutant means? So when we learn uh, in chemical ocean, the resident time, meaning that the time taken for uh, a material to be brought out uh, out of the sea, uh, so we cannot expect uh, plastic to be evaporate like a water because they are a solid matter. They cannot be evaporate. But the moment the plastic uh, become uh, reduced, become uh, undergo uh, a hot weathering, they will become microplastic, and at that moment they will, they can be evaporate into the air or become a uh, water vapor. So microplastic can act as a carrier for the transfer of POP, persistent organic pollutant from the environment to organism. So what is POP? Actually, microplastic is not a POP, but they are a carrier to transfer a POP. POP is uh, a chemical substance uh, brought by a certain kind of material. And that chemical will be hazardous to uh, human health. So since uh, plastic is not biodegradable because they are mineral oil based, so does the microplastic. So they will stay in the ocean for a long time, whether they will be eaten by an organism such as a uh, turtle, uh, other fish, or they will become integrated uh, into smaller part like a microplastic. So what does biological integration in organism mean? Okay, for example, uh, let us think about food chain, for example. Uh, the moment the microplastic get eaten by a smaller fish, they will, that uh, small fish will be eaten by a bigger fish. And that bigger fish will not eat just one small fish, right? They will eat multiple small fish. So each of that uh, small fish eat a certain amount of microplastic. So this is a biomagnification. Uh, this is what uh, the meaning of biomagnification. Bio biomagnification means 
that the the higher uh, an organism in the uh, hierarchy of food chain, uh, the higher the biomagnification will be uh, in that particular organism. So since we are the apex predator in the uh, food chain, human, we will eat the biggest uh, fish, for example, like tuna. So tuna will eat so many uh, small fish and that tuna will accumulate a certain amount of microplastic. And we human will not eat just one tuna, right? We will eat maybe two or three tuna in a month. So we human will accumulate so much more microplastic in our body in a coming year. So uh, bio biological integration in organism will enter the body through respiration or eating other organism. Respiration means for uh, a fish, not for human because we cannot inhale microplastic in the air. We cannot see plastic in the air, right? So bio magnification happen will go up as the food chain continue. And plus the microplastic, can stress and bleach the coral reef, which will damage our uh, tourism industry, our uh, aesthetic of ocean, and that will become a huge problem in, in the future. So the spotlight uh, for this uh, presentation today is what does microplastic do to us human? So several study has have demonstrated that potentially, only potentially of metabolic disturbance, neurotoxicity, and increase of cancer risk in human. And for example, like group uh, Nazahan and Lumanil, they, they say that uh, microplastic found in uh, fetus, no placenta, in placenta. So this show that in certain cases, microplastic can, uh, campur tangan apa? can disturb can disturb a uh, human human body human body to uh, function however after a deep research there is no real risk for human because our uh, our sam our sample size is not big enough because the microplastic is reported is not many enough for us to deduct that microplastic is harmful to human so since that happened we can conclude that no visible risk as the poison is in the dose because we as a human maybe just maybe we only consume a certain amount of microplastic and that amount is not not yet not yet harmful for a uh, human body but is this a good news no because uh, we live in the earth we human is not the only organism uh, in earth so as I said before, uh, microplastic will harm uh, organism, marine organisms such as turtle, uh, coral reef, and if they they will they will be disturbed in the in their food chain, maybe someday we will be uh, affected too. But in the incoming year, fortunately, we human can uh, just lay back and we are not quite uh, affected by this microplastic stuff. So that's all from us. So let's open our question and answer session. Thank you so much, Brother Fahmi and Brother Mio. Okay, so open up the question session. If you have anything to ask about this microplastics, I think it's quite a trending issue right now. Uh, even it's not in the oceans, even in the fresh water also. Anything to your friends or you are already sleepy? <laughs> so, so I think the last, the last uh, recent news is about the microplastic in our bloodstream. And also there was also news about the microplastic found in the, I would say in the poop. Okay. So, brother, for this group, so actually, how can we prevent this one? Actually, in real life, frankly speaking, how can we prevent this to, 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 to avoid this one, to avoid this problem? So, how can your... we prevent microplastic? Is that correct? Is that the question? Yeah, it's very quite general. Okay. So, actually, microplastic is a subtopic for plastic pollution. 
uh, subtopic for group Nurmanil and Nazahan in my opinion. So the uh, the way for us to prevent this problem will be the same as as group Lumanil and Azan, which we need to invent a new uh, medium for us to replace plastic. Uh, for example, we uh, we use the reusable uh, plastic such as we get in IKEA in the Catalan, uh, which that kind of bag we can use over and over again. We not uh, we will not use them uh, for one, one use at a time. We, we use one and we throw it away. No, we don't want that. Or, or maybe we can reduce uh, the amount of plastic manufacturing, uh, such as the water bottle or other tire maybe. So we need to invent a new way for us to live. Uh, we need to find uh, we need to reduce, reuse, and recycle uh, the resources we have today. Uh, overall, we need to come to the basic of a uh, sustainable development lifestyle. Uh, we need to use back the resources we have. We need to reduce uh, the damage we uh, we do to the to the uh, environment, and that's all. Uh, that is that that actually the thing that we need to do for our environment. Ah, that's my answer. Thank you. But, but let's talk to the real life. Can we really avoid plastic? I mean, like, I'm asking a very frank question right now. In your opinion or other people's opinion in, in this session, you got? Actually, uh, personally, <laughs> I think we cannot escape the use of plastic uh, because it become the basic uh, basic, needs. basic needs in our society today. Uh, we need the plastic, but maybe uh, someday in the future, we will have other, uh, other option uh, that can replace plastic, but not, 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 not in the uh, not in this time. Uh, not this in this during stay I mean, I mean. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I would say that uh, like, like the the, the, uh, the previous group. I mean, like plastic is kind of forever. Some some of the plastic is five hundred years, if I'm not mistaken. That uh, that you say that now, and then our lifetime is like around 70, 70 years, and. Uh, the, the usage, the problem is about the plastic that, I mean, like this, that is very cheap. That's a problem uh, because the, you, you can buy plastic for just sin in sin. And then if you want to replace that, you need to pay more. For example, the reusable plastic, uh, you buy a plastic just uh, like uh, one 10 cent and then you buy the reusable plastic, like a reusable bottle is around, well, 10 ringgit, 20 ringgit for those who like Starbucks hundred something ringgit. And then you say that you want to use and then the, the Starbuck uh, comes up with a new product and then you buy that again. So it's kind of, it's like the same for me on my side. Anyone want to have some opinion on this? You can share to me on, on, on this matter. The trust no anything on your side? Or else I need to, Nina, for this session. Any comment or anything that uh, maybe not this group for the previous one before we end up our session? The trust not you saying something about it? No, eh? Oh, no, no, that is, that is. I, I, oh, sorry. I thought you that mute me. Okay, so I think that's all for the session today for this uh, program, uh, for this uh, Youth Freedom Program. And through all of these programs, we have found out that uh, even though we actually are discussing about six of uh, types of pollution, but there are more types of pollution that exist actually. And then the, if, you, if you talk about uh, 
if you talk about all of this topic, I would say, generally speaking, it is caused by us human. I would say it is caused by us humans. And some of this is related to the management and some of it due to uh, not the natural cause. Most of it is just because of this human. So some of you talk about karma, some of you about uh, what goes around, what goes around. So it will back to us. Uh, for us as a Khalifa, we have a responsibility to do. And for us as a Muslim, this is actually one of the one of our dawah uh, because environment is something that you must protect. It's an Allah gift for us. It's a something that you must protect. It's not just our life also, uh, but uh, it's something you must protect. And everything that we do for that is part uh, part of the dawah. So if you can think on that matter, okay. So this is uh, some of the pictures that uh, of the beach cleanup that we have been we have been uh, doing. For the past few years, it is only a small, uh, small uh, pictures. But uh, the thing is that uh, the action of this one person actually might be trivial. You might think that ah, no, it's only me doing all this one, and that's the thing. And you do not uh, do not lose your your confidence here, uh, because of if we everyone knows if the knowledge at least the knowledge of these thousand of people. And we are actually doing the same thing, a very, very small action, just such as not, uh, not, not throwing rubbish at, uh, at any, any wood or water body. So actually, it really does an effect. It really does. Uh, so you are not alone in this, uh, in this journey. So let's everyone, uh, let's protect our oceans. Uh, so if we are not protecting it, who else? We only have this planet. Uh, like uh, I don't know which which group uh, we don't have a planet B, okay. So I think that's all for our session today. I would like to thank you everyone, and we are going to have the sessions uh, to be stored in our um, uh, YouTube channel, and I will share the link to everyone here. Okay, thank you so much.